Tonight I want to bring you a message from uh, Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. I encourage you to turn there. Just going to look as we start off with two verses of Scripture here. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. And this is, uh, this is what the Bible says. Joshua 24, verse 14. It says, Now, now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers, the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for one more opportunity to assemble here tonight. I thank you for the church around the world, for the congregation that meets here regularly. Those who believe, and because they believe, they've obeyed. And because they've obeyed and you're faithful, we're saved by the grace of God, by your grace, by your goodness. Thank you for your great love and mercy. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to present your word tonight. Pray that every word spoken will bring you glory. And I do ask, as always, that you'll grow your church. Because the increase belongs to you, I pray that you'll do heart surgery. Like you did on Lydia, the riverbanks of Philippi in Acts chapter 16, where the Bible says that you opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Father, as Paul's message is presented here tonight, the gospel of Jesus Christ, may you be glorified, may you work to grow your church in this place. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Joshua chapter 24, it's good when you read any passage of Scripture and look at who it is that's speaking, you know, when you pick up the Bible anywhere you turn. And who is the speaker? Who Many times, who, who writes it? When you look at Joshua chapter 24, that's a considerable question, you know. Who's the speaker? Well, that's what I was hoping you was going to question. Because that's what I'm prepared to talk about for a minute. Uh, when you open up Joshua chapter 24, Joshua's the speaker. And Joshua, when you really think about it, you really can't skip over the first five books of the Bible to get to the book of Joshua because, uh, well, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, before you get to Joshua, and Joshua is through those five books. Uh, well, I mean, he's not there in the book of Genesis, but he is there from Exodus on. Uh, Joshua is there when Moses, who we're familiar with, Moses goes... Uh, He's 80 years old. He's called to see the Pharaoh. And Moses goes and says, let my people go. And, and with God's mighty hand at work, when God humbles the Egyptians, and specifically Pharaoh, God leads the people out of Egypt. And we've heard the, that story many times. The water was turned to blood, and frogs and gnats and flies and livestock and boils and hell and locusts and darkness and lastly, the plague, the death, the firstborn. And Pharaoh, finally, his country was plundered and he was humbled and he said, get those Israelite people and get them out of here. Even though he shortly changed his mind and pursued them anyway. But when the Israelites came out of Egypt, do you know Joshua? Joshua was over 20 years old when that happened. And see, Moses, Moses comes out of Egypt Moses is taking the people to the promised land, the land that Abram had left all the years before. He left the land of the Chaldeans to come to that land. And Abraham traveled through that land, the promised land, and now God is sending Moses to the promised land. And do you know, do you know how many miles it is from Egypt to the promised land? That's about 175 miles. You know when the wagons were moving west? That the rule of thumb, average day travel, you can make 20 miles a day on a wagon moving west all those years ago. Well, I mean, if you take your time and you can only make 17 and a half miles a day, 
175 miles, man, we'll be there next week. Let's do it. You know how long it takes Moses to get 175 miles? Uh, 40 years. You know why? Because they leave, they leave Egypt and they're heading towards the promised land. And before they get over to the promised land, Moses uh, takes uh, camp there at camp. He, he decides he's going to send some spies. He's going to send one spy from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's 12 sons, those tribes. He's going to send one man from each tribe. And he sends them 12 total, 12 spies into Canaan. And when they come back out of Canaan, when they come back out of Canaan, they all have the same report in that that land is full of milk and honey. Everybody said that. The land is good. That is a good land. That is a promising land. Milk and honey. It's flowing with it. And when you think about it, for the land to flow with milk means you've got to have milk cows, right? you got to have cows. And to have plenty of cows, you've got to have plenty of vegetation, you see. So to say that the land is flowing with milk means that there's a lot of cows and there's a lot of stuff for cows to eat, which means it's a plentiful land. It's a good land. And to say that the land is flowing with honey means there's plenty of pollination going on. There's plenty of variety. This is a good, this is a good place. This is a promising land. And all 12 people said, man, it's great. The land is wonderful, it's spacious, it's flowing with milk and honey. However, ten spies who went out of twelve, ten spies came back and said, the land is good, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but the land is occupied by fortified villages and cities. The land is occupied by these giants. And we're only grasshoppers in their eyes. Compared to them, we're nothing. <coughs> and two of those 12 spies, I'm guessing they're doing this. They're just scratching their heads. And they've got to be thinking to themselves, where were those 10 guys at when we came out of Egypt? Well, the two good spies, their names were Joshua and Caleb. And those spies, they say the land is full of milk and honey, but with God's help, we'll take the land. We just came out of Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful country in the world. It was a world powerhouse, and God plundered them. And with God's help, who can stop us? Let's go get it. But the people wouldn't have it. And because the people wouldn't have it, an entire generation of people died in the desert. <laughs> Do you know when Joshua came out of Egypt? They took a census. There are two census in the book of Numbers. And the first census, when they came out of Egypt, there were over 20 years old who could fight an army. Males, there were 603,550 men. Not counting the Levites. 603,550 men. And only two of the 12 spies could see that with God's help, what's impossible for them? And every single person over 20 years old who came out of Egypt died. Without exception, including Moses. Moses didn't go in the promised land. He got to see it. He didn't get to go. The only two are Joshua and Caleb. But Joshua's right there, you see. Joshua comes out of Egypt. Joshua gets to go into the promised land. And he gets to visit. And then he comes back out and he wanders in the desert with Moses. For 40 years. And if I ask you a question tonight, I say, uh, who went up on Mount Sinai and got the Ten Commandments? And then hopefully, everybody would say, uh, it's easy for each of us, Moses. That's true. Moses did go up on Mount Sinai. Moses got the Ten Commandments. But do you know, do you know that when Moses came down the mountain, as Moses came down the mountain and got closer to where the Israelites were camped, the Bible says in Exodus Chapter uh, chapter 22, uh, Exodus chapter 32, chapter 32, verse 17. It was there when Moses came down the mountain that his aide said to him, Is that the sound of battle I hear in the camp? Do you know who Moses' aide was? It starts with J and ends with Oshawa. Joshua. Joshua was up on the mountain with Moses. Moses 
and Joshua like that right there. In fact, when you read Exodus chapter 33, chapter 33, verse 11, it says the Lord would speak, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Do you know that Joshua was right beside Moses every step of the way? And all the whining and crying that Moses heard in the wilderness, Joshua was right there with him. And when God talked to Moses inside the tent, Joshua was inside the tent there too. And when Moses got the Ten Commandments, Joshua was beside of him, came right down the mountain beside of him. Joshua was right there every step of the way. And when Moses climbed, Moses climbed Mount Nebo, He's 120 years old. His strength is not gone. His eyes are not weak. And he gets to see. He gets to see in the promised land, but he doesn't get to enter. And he dies there on top of the mountain of Nebo at 120 years old. And in the Israelites, uh, as Joshua comes down the mountain, because uh, Moses appoints him to take charge after he dies, Joshua comes down the mountain and the Israelites camp for 30 days. They mourn for Moses for 30 days. But they marched 175 miles or so. They actually made some circles, really. So it's a lot farther than 175 miles, but the distance. They've traveled and they're on the edge now of the Jordan River, ready to cross over into the Promised Land. Joshua's been there, but it's been 40 years since he's been there, you know. And what he tells everybody to do. He says, we're going to get ready and we're going to go into the promised land and we're going to go across the Jordan River. Everybody get ready and we're going to cross the Jordan River. It's in Joshua chapter 3. And maybe most notable is where it says in the book of Joshua, it says, now the Jordan, the Jordan River was at flood stage. Now the Jordan River is only about 100 miles long. It flows from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest lying body of water on the planet. And most of the time it's not that frightening force. But when it's a flood stage, on both sides of the riverbeds, you got mountains. And the mountains stick up several thousand feet there, a couple thousand feet. And so the riverbed, when it's a flood stage, is 2,600 to 5,200 feet wide. That's a half mile or more. It's a fearsome force when that river's a flood stage. In fact, it was big enough that all the Jericho people, they said, you know, nobody's going to cross the river until the river goes down, that's for sure. We got some time, boys. We got some time. That's what they thought. Joshua said to the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant, he said, they can go in front, a distance of about a thousand yards. And the Bible teaches us when the feet, when the feet of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant touched the water. The water of the Jordan River stopped flowing. It was coming downstream and it stopped, and there was a wall of water. And what was happening downstream continued to flow on as the people, the Israelites, crossed the Jordan River on dry land. Just as miraculous as it was when they crossed the Red Sea 40 years before. They crossed on dry land. And there wasn't. There wasn't as many people. No, when they took the first census, there were 603,550 men. But 40 years or so later, when they took the second census, there were 601,730 men over 20 years old who could handle the sword or fight the army, not counting the Levites. So there wasn't as many because a generation died in the wilderness. Nonetheless, an army crosses over. They cross over the Jordan River and Joshua's right there with them. And what happens in the book of Joshua is, I've joked about it before, but this is, this is truth. They kicked butt and they took name. That's what they did. Everywhere they went, they defeated their enemies. And everybody they defeated, they listed their names. It's in Joshua chapter 12. There are 31 different kings that Joshua and the Israelites defeated. And Joshua's been through it, boys. And now in Joshua chapter 24, that's where we started. Joshua is 110 years old. And you've got to imagine wrinkles on his face. He's a warrior. He's a leader. He's been through it. He was a slave in Egypt, evidently, as a young boy. And he came out and he saw.
saw and he witnessed the things that we're only going to get to talk about when we get to heaven in the fullest. He got to see it. He got to experience it. He came out of the out of Egypt and into the wilderness. He was a spy in the promised land. He was back in the wilderness. He was up on the mountain with Moses. He was there in the tabernacle with Moses. Joshua, with the silver hair and the wrinkles on his face, a warrior, a leader, fearless, the, 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 the battle, the, the leader, the victorious. Joshua. In fact, he's one of the few people in the Bible that we know a lot about that we really don't know much about about. I mean, King David won't pass that test, you know. Joshua. Who's led the people fearlessly. Who's been through it thick and thin. And who's experienced it every step of the way. Joshua stands up in what's called his farewell address. And he says in chapter 24, verse 14 and 15, which is where we started. Well, look what he said before that. He, he says in verse 12, Joshua 24, verse 12, he says, because you, you would think, you would think that maybe he would be proud. Maybe he would say, who can defeat me? I'm the man. Look, look what I did. Joshua doesn't say that at all. In Joshua 24, 12, look what he says. He says, God sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out your enemies before you. God was driving them out before we even got here. Notice what he says in, at the end of verse 12. He says, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. What you? What me? We didn't do it. Verse 13, Joshua said, so God, God gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. We didn't do it. God did it. And we just enjoy the blessings of the Almighty, the living God. That's the attitude of Joshua. And hear what he says in his farewell dress where we started in verse 14 and 15. He says, in short there, he says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The Bible teaches us the Bible teaches us that when when Joshua died all of Israel continued to follow the Lord. In fact, they continued to follow the Lord until the elders who lived with Joshua until all of them died. And then in the book of Judges, I mean, it's wild. I mean, those people just become ruthless. And the Bible says two different occasions in the book of Judges it says each man, each man done as he saw was right in his own eyes. Everybody just done what they thought was right. And it's wild time in the book of Judges. But as long as the people lived and the elders who lived with Joshua could remember his faithfulness and his example and his witness and his instructions. Choose this day if you will serve. But as for me my house will serve the Lord. As long as they can remember, they serve the Lord. Just leads us to the question, who we serve? We're tempted to think that uh, in all our sophistication, we're not bowing down to idols anymore. And when Joshua says, are you going to serve the gods they served in Egypt? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about idols of wood and stone and gold and silver. He's talking about the God of the Amorites and the Baal, the Baal out of worship that would soon follow in the book of Judges. He says, choose whom you're going to serve. And we're so tempted to say in all of our sophistication, well, we don't, we don't bow down to statues anymore. Is that true? I'll show you what you're bound down to when you show me your calendar, just show me where you spend your time and I'll show you what God you serve. Because you've got 168 hours in the week just like I do and everybody else has got. And there are people who spend their time serving the Lord God Almighty and there are people who don't. And you show me where you spend your time and I'll show you what you're worship. I can tell you what's in your heart. But to do that, you're going to have to give me your checkbook for just a few minutes. And I can show you what's in your heart. Because we're, what's in our hearts 
That's where money goes. That's where our time goes. And if you notice, people talk about people talk about what they love. You ever notice that? You see a guy out there at the store with a NASCAR hat, a NASCAR hat on, and each your driver. You know what you know about? It's Dale Jr. Man, that, you see Dale Jr. on Sunday? I'll tell you what, he really good there. Down at the race. They'll talk about it, and they'll talk your leg off. I see these guys at the, at the store. They've got a coal miner hat on. I was a mining engineer for six years. I've been at coal mines underground in five different states. Been in the biggest uh, surface job in the Western Hemisphere at that time. I know about coal mining, shuttle cars, a ram cars, the long walls. Man, I've seen all of them. You want to talk about coal mining? Let's mine some coal. And they love it. I'm telling you what. And if you ain't been there, you don't know it. You can't talk about it. But if you have been, you know it. People talk about what they know. People talk about what they like. And how many times do people ever take time to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ? We can talk to them about the ball game. We can talk to them about what kind of prayer didn't do right. Can't we, Jack? We know. But how many people are we talking to about the Lord? We're still, we're still bound down to idols. We're so much more sophisticated, but it's so much still the same. What we got is this, this example. Not just from Joshua and his silver hair and the wrinkles on his face and 110 years old who's been through the battles, but all the faithful saints who we've seen. People in our lives who've been touched and impacted. People who became Christians and lived that way. Because it's the Word of God, that's why. Because Jesus Christ is not in the grave. Because God's grace is sufficient. Because heaven's for real. We've seen that example. But the question remains what we're going to do about it. We got, a, we got a question to consider. Who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve the gods that the culture bound down to, the ball teams and the ball players? Are we going to serve the bass boat and the big screen TVs and the four wheelers and the, whatever gets our time, whatever gets our money? Is that what we're going to bow down to? You got a choice. If you've been touched by somebody who believed the Believed in the Lord who served the Lord with all his heart. You've been touched by somebody like Joshua in that way who fought the Lord's army and gained the victory because God's victorious. What are you going to do with it? we got a choice to make. And we make it. It's not just, it's not so simple as to say, well, I made it. I made the decision. It's every day we make a decision. Who we're going to serve today, it's a new decision. Every day. What are we going to do? Are we going to stand boldly? Stand boldly and say, for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. It's not going to be easy. But that's what we've got to do. That's the question. Tonight as we sing number 614.